Jessica Vavris from WASDA here presenting your week 13 legislative update webinar. Thanks to everyone who's joining the live webinar today. Um, we're gonna just jump right in. Um, as per usual, you can find the materials and the recordings on our YouTube, YouTube page as well as our LegRep webpage. So hopefully um, you're finding some use in the webinar slides. They are downloadable for you to use with your boards and other groups, so please do access those. And then um, I did update this link. This is actually for the written weekly updates um, that are posted regularly on Sundays. Um, again, as you join, please um, enter into my question box or your question box, who you are and what district you're from. And um, in light of sort of where we are in the legislative process, um, all of you probably who are on the webinar have a regular uh, connection with your boards on legislative issues. Um, but I'd be interested just as we go throughout the next hour or so to hear what are the things you're talking about in your boards um, related to what's cooking in the legislature as well as um, what you're hearing from your legislators as to what's cooking. So um, type that into the chat box, please. Okay, so this slide um, just gives you a peek of what the past foundational issues are and what we cover each week on our webinar. And last week we did not do a deeper dive or a foundations piece. We will do that um, this week, as you will see in the next slide. Um, but, again, but again, these are good for orienting new ledge reps or new board members. Um, I'm happy if there's one that you see, I'm happy to visit with um, you or your board members more about that given thing. Um, at you know, the interim's a great time to sort of learn a little more for new ledge reps, et cetera. Your ledge committee members, the WASDA ledge committee members are also a great resource for you. Um, so today we're gonna do the standard operating um, procedure for what's happening in the legislature and sort of look at looking ahead to the last, um, I think it's like 16 or 18 days of the legislature uh, for the regular session and then also upcoming WASDA events that are on the horizon. Um, and I will show you how some of the things that as they're um, negotiating the final two most important documents, which are the operating budget and the capital budget for the 1921 um, biennium, I'll show you some of the things that we look at as we're um, considering those two big documents. All right, so we'll just jump right in. And gosh, I did not update this slide yet. I will update it when um, I post it, but we are actually on day 89, um, which means we have 16 days to go. Um, and as in the past, um, we, as in the past, the end game issues remain. Um, what isn't on this list, and you'll see when we talk about sticking points for sort of this end of the process, window we're in um, includes revenue or taxes and uh, what is the will of the chambers together to take either um, bold moves like the Senate is proposing around sort of broader, um, well, they're both proposing different bold moves. So one is around tax reform, the tax structure, which is what the Senate is looking at. And then on the House side, it's sort of um, various approaches to new revenue and new taxes. And so those will be two issues that um, will certainly be getting more play as we move on. Um, we should, I will cross off April 9th because we are now past that. Um, we have passed the opposite, the second fiscal cutoff. And then, so the next cutoff is Basically, next Wednesday, 5 o'clock, I believe, is the opposite house cutoff. And that's really most important for bills that are policy policy only bills um, to keep moving. A lot of the bills that and issues that we are really engaging in on are necessary to implement the budget. So uh, they will keep moving on. All right, um, so this is a look at sort of where we are now, and um, you can see now, although the floor vote the, is, is generally sometimes a good time to influence, I would say that we're in sort of the red and yellow time for how to influence 
um, bills and policies. Really, when we look at what starts happening in the conference committees and the conference agreements, um, now is the time to be communicating about some of those issues that we know will go to a conference committee. And if you'll recall from last week, if you watched last week's recording, um, bills go to a conference committee when they've come over from the opposite chamber, uh, from the chamber of origin to the next chamber, and that chamber that they're in now changes something in the bill. They then go back to the home, they go back to chamber one, um, and a committee is created, usually of um, three or four people from each chamber officially, and then there's sort of others who work the issue on the peripheral. So an example of an issue um, actually, most of our big issues will probably go to a conference committee. Um, one example is special education funding. Um, and so there are the main bill that is in play right now is Senate Bill 5091. Um, and that the House has put a different proposal on um, that bill number. It does not align with what the Senate is saying. So that'll go to a conference committee. Um, and then they will basically cook up the final agreed upon uh, policy. And these floor votes, the second, these sort of final floor votes, there is not, this is not when new amendments are put on the bill. It's generally when everything is agreed to. Um, the last couple of sessions, we've seen that procedural um, step in the process, go a little, um, be interesting, I guess, on the budget side of things. But in an ideal world, the conference committee agrees, both chambers agree, goes to a perfunctory floor vote, people get to say their pieces on the bills, um, and then they move on through the process. So this reconciliation portion is really hard to influence the budget or bills that we want to see moving. So we're still kind of in this yellow and green uh, side of things, um, and we're, uh, but it is quickly getting to a point where we won't be able to um, influence um, bills. Okay. So like I said, um, this kind of builds on dead bills and issues that may be sort of going into hibernation. Um, so officially we're at a point where bills would be, um, they're officially dead if they're voted up or voted down, sorry, on the House or Senate floor or at the end of the second year of the biennium. So when we leave the regular session, um, the next session, whether it's a special session or the supplemental short session that happens starting in January, all the bills and bill numbers come back alive. Um, and it just, special sessions usually have a focus, but just so you know, those bills are sort of revived um, in a procedural way. Um, there are um, ways to influence on that previous slide, there was sort of the governor veto option, the partial veto. Um, that's where, so governor staff starting now are starting to talk to stakeholders like WASDA about what parts of bills and um, the governor has the prerogative to be able to veto full sections of bills. So there might be a section of a bill that we've been engaged in that we think would be better without that section. Um, we've asked for veto, requ uh, we've requested vetoes um, in collaboration actually with the School Administrators Association over the past couple of sessions on any number of things. I think last year it was regarding the, um, I think it was the students, hung the hunger, hunger, hungry students bill of rights or something like that. And there were some requirements for schools um, in terms of uh, that were actually quite complicating factors related to that bill. So we did uh, that we did not feel districts had a chance to really understand or weigh in on. So that's one example. I think we've asked for um, examples regarding um, the capital budget in the past and some other things. So um, there are a couple of bills that we are watching to see how they change, if at all, on their next floor votes. Um, uh, House Bill 1660, the extracurricular activities bill is one um, that we think the removal of a certain section would actually help the bill be more doable for school districts. So that that might be one that we um, weigh in on a veto request. So things that are, there are more bills, um, the House, 
well, both the House and the Senate, and you'll see in a minute when we go through the deeper dive, in the budget documents themselves, sometimes specific bills are named. So $50,000 to implement House Bill 1272 or whatever it is. Um, and that some would say that when a bill is named like that with a dollar amount in the budget proposal, it is necessary to implement the budget. Um, that there isn't a hard and fast definition of necessary to implement the budget. It sort of depends. And so sometimes, like if a bill dies, um, the budget could be uh, changed to take the bill number out, but to still fund that activity. So there are lots of little um, budgetary uh, maneuvers that can happen to fund bills or activities, even if the policy bill they were hitched to dies. Um, so that, and those are called budget provisos and those end up obviously in, in some section of the budget somewhere. Um, so I'm gonna just jump in and as I go, if you have questions or want a little more information, do please type that into the chat box and I'm just reviewing those as we switch each slide. Um, so a couple of things um, to note, this is sort of the summary to date of um, notable or uh, notable things that happened this week. The schedule um, actually provides sort of what was up for public hearing early in the week before the cutoff and then what was on the schedule for um, executive session and some bills moved and some bills did not move. Um, and so that's this first section. So things of note, again, this is not comprehensive. I will show you the comprehensive bill watch in a moment. But um, since the action on 2140, uh, the basic ed funding bill in the House did not happen until Saturday. I wanted to make sure you guys got that memo. It was mentioned in the weekly update as well. So basically what the House Appropriations Committee did was they amended um, House Bill 2140, the, you might recall the proposed bill had levies and special ed and institutional ed funding. Um, I think it, they did something else. Oh, no, they didn't have institutional ed. They had parapros in there. So basically the bill that left, that was voted on, that left the Appropriations Committee is now purely a levy and local effort assistance bill. Um, when we are talking about that bill, the other thing that I'll show you in a moment uh, that we also are talking about on the House side of things that likely might have been generating some discussion in your communities is the hold harmless provision that was added to the House budget um, when they passed it off their floor. So that is a $58 million hold harmless piece um, that was added to it. Um, other actions, the transport, the healthcare benefits and transportation contracts, that bill, people are calling it the SEB for transportation contracts bill, um, House Bill 1813, that did get voted out of Ways and Means. Um, it's a team, the Teamsters Union is strongly behind that bill. Um, it's one that districts, um, it's, an, it's worthy of some looking at what the implications of that bill would be on the contracts um, that you let to, that you put out to your transportation carriers. So um, we testified against it, um, as has WASA in the past, um, with a really strong concern about the unfunded mandate component of it. The early childhood bills um, around expanding eligibility and access are also moving. Um, the extracurricular, <laughs> extracurricular activity bill that I mentioned earlier, that bill is um, did get voted out of Ways and Means. It did not get changed in any way. I honestly, um, although we're still working on adjustments to it, I, I would be surprised if it gets changed in the Senate, um, but it could, you never know. Um, so that one is still moving along, as is um, the Educator Workforce Recruitment and Retention Bill. And so you can see a couple of those, actually those aren't down here. The things that did not, um, that have not moved that you will see on the bill watch that I show you in a minute, the K-3 class size uh, reduction uh, requirement 
that delay bill um, that would de delay that requirement, sorry, um, House Bill 2108, that was scheduled for an executive se session in Ways and Means, um, and it got removed from their calendar. So um, basically, we're all sort of trying to figure out what was that about. One of the things that um, should be noted is that policy to delay the requirement of K3 class size the 17 to 1 ratio, but to still provide the dollars to districts. That has used the last couple of years, uh, the last couple of sessions, that's been provided for in the operating budget as a proviso, like I mentioned before. So there is a body of thinking that, well, we've done it in the budget um, in past years. This is something that we do not, we, the legislature, do not want to delay forever. And there's some concern um, that we've heard that if it is delayed, in, if the bill passes, it would codify this idea of delaying the requirement. And that would then require the state to um, book those dollars out in the four-year four outlook. And it would have larger implications on the, the budget than um, they they necessarily intend so it's a little bit messy we are advocating for the bill um but also know that it's not done until we see the dollars in the budget obviously school resource officers um the training that bill fifth uh, senate bill 5141 um is one that would have provided a definition for school resource officers and some funding to support that training as well as for districts to provide school resource officers. That bill did not move out of the House Appropriations Committee. Um, and however, like I said earlier, in the budget, it is one of the bills that is named in the budget. Actually, all three of these bills where sort of they were either voted down or they didn't move, um, they are named in the budget. So um, that arguably they will be discussions in sort of the end of day. Um, budget negotiations with that conference committee. Um, the, the bottom part of this slide just sort of gives you a potpourri of some of the actions or anticipated actions um, that we know of right now um, on some of the bills that I probably get the most questions about. So um, the House did take action on the bill uh, Senate Bill 5689, which would will require districts to review and update your anti-harassment, um, intimidation, and bullying policies and procedures, as well as any policies and procedures um, related to non-discrimination or transgender students. So um, it is not requiring districts to adopt a standalone transgender student policy and procedure, but it is requiring districts to um, assure that content and um, support for transgender students is included in um, a policy and procedure that you have on your books. Um, the most common one that we're seeing if a district has not adopted a standalone transgender student policy and procedure has been the non-discrimination policy and procedure. And um, so that is the main substance of what changed in the Senate. Uh, actually what changed in the House um, on that Senate bill. Um, today, the Senate is, uh, ha is debating and voting on the comprehensive student safety bill that will create um, capacity in all nine regional ESDs as well as at OSPI for uh, supporting districts around student safety and well-being issues. Um, one of the things of note that we'll probably dig into more next week around WASDA's priorities, a big priority of ours, as well as our sister associations, um, and certainly the WEA, has been the um, need for more, more individuals, bodies in schools to support student mental health and behavioral supports. Um, so student, um, Guide, so counselors, obviously, as well as psychologists, school nurses, social workers, those types of roles. That is not um, the house budget has a little bit for targeted for schools that receive targeted assistance, um, but it is not an across the board increase. So that will be something that I think as we look to the interim and next session will want will likely rise to the top of something that was not addressed this session. Uh, para educators, that bill is on the floor calendar, as well as 
um, the social emotional learning and children's mental health. The children's mental health bill does provide for additional resource, again, building that capacity within the regions to support school districts uh, for behavioral health supports and mental health supports um, in the ESDs. I believe that bill still contains that piece. Um, it is on the house floor calendar. Um, and then the graduation requirements and pathways bill that I will add that bill number, it's house bill 1599. It is, um, it has not been put on the calendar. They still have several days. My guess, the way we see things go is uh, issues like that, it's a sticky issue. Um, and it is one that they probably won't run until um, closer to the cutoff next Wednesday. So, um, but it is one that we shouldn't just wait for them to um, move. It is one we're hoping that districts can communicate on. All right, so like I said, some of the sticking points. So the um, difference, so the first one is not one I'm not, I'm gonna go into depth on. I think next week uh, we'll be better poised to that because we will be better able to see sort of what, uh, if, what if any action or movement is happening on the revenue or tax proposals that each of the chambers um, have put forward to fund their different budgets. Um, the these links provide you um, links they were linked to in last week's update um, but in terms of the comparison of the budgets i wanted to sh if you didn't click on, i know i give you a lot of hyperlinks in the weekly updates so i wanted to um, point out especially this uh, comparison just so you can get a feel for how far apart the house and senate are on their um, given budget and um, this was one, and I'll, um, I think I, sh I showed you a couple weeks ago how to do a comparison from the fiscal.wa.gov website. Um, I will make this bigger for you. Um, but I, I did want, I um, basically pulled out all of the items uh, related to public schools. And then I thought about WASDA's priorities. And so this is a modified spreadsheet. Um, that doesn't have the huge laundry list. It would be very long of all the different components of the um, proposals, but I pulled out key pieces related to student and school health and safety, uh, equitable funding, some of the funding issues, um, student success, so that would be educator recruitment, retention, graduation requirements, those sorts of things, As uh, and then we have the school facilities as a separate side-by-side. -side. So the way that you read this, um, I kept in some of the maintenance level um, adjustments that are important to remember that they are planning on funding these things. So an increase in the health benefit, the health benefit rate, additional professional learning days, additional dollars for salaries, K-12 salaries based on the experience factor and the um, and regionalization. Um, and then you can see sort of the increases in a couple of other areas. If you are interested in the full spreadsheet, let me know. I can send that to you. I'm just send me an email. I'm, I'm seeing a couple comments that you might not be getting sound. So if, if someone, um, Suzanne or Deb or Jim, if you could just type in that you can hear me, um, I would appreciate that. Okay, so on the policy, so then this uh, orange highlighted row, um, these are the new policy changes. Um, and so you can see the different components. And again, on the left, column is the Senate proposal, on the middle is the House, and on the far right is the difference between the two. Um, and then, I'm not going to go through each of these, but then at the end of the document is what in the budget notes the House and Senate have said about that given proposal. So local effort assistance, you can see this is the House's proposal that's in 2140, um, etc. The thing that is not yet put into the budget. So I'll speak to special ed in a minute, but when you look at the special education pieces, so um, I believe number 35 is, um, actually we can look at number 35, so yes. So that is the um, federal, the removal of the safety net from the federal 
um, IDEA moving it to the state. Um, and then the other special ed one, the smaller amount, I think 6.9 million is uh, funding for the policy related special ed bill in the Senate 5532. Um, and then when we get to sort of this interesting interplay between the multiplier, which is kind of the, the main discussion this week, the excess cost multiplier for special education, you'll see line 100, item 100 and item 114 on this comparison. And um, you'll see, so basically um, the box that the house is working within is the $69 million and some change box. Their proposal uh, originally in 2140 was um, a 0.9925 multiplier. So remember right now we're at a 0.96 multiplier. Their proposal was to move that up to a 0.9925. Their proposal is different now. It is um, a two-tiered uh, model that I'll talk to and I'll speak to in a minute, but their box, their size of their amount of money has not changed. They, they are um, clearly, as we talk to those legislators working on that policy, are still booking and planning on this $69,600,000 um, allocation. On the Senate side, um, their multiplier, their approach to the multiplier has not changed. They, um, in Senate Bill 5091, the multiplier booked there and that which is booked in their budget is a 1.0 multiplier across the board. So um, you can see that um, different. Uh, so actually I do see um, Dave, Dave Larson from Tequila, thank you for your question. So his question is whether there's a district level impact spreadsheet for the hold harmless provision um, that we'll, I'll speak to in a moment. Um, I will, um, we can look for that, um, but thank you for asking Dave. Um, okay, so then you can see here on this one, the special, the school employee benefits, the difference in those dollars, and then a few of the other smaller components that I wanted to um, be sure to point out. Um, so the capital budget, I'm not going to um, click on that, but that also was linked to in last week's report. I did want to pull out, and um, this may get to um, part of the answer on um, what is being assumed in the budget. Um, actually, actually, I'm sorry. Dave, I do know the answer to that. The hold harmless, oh, you want the district by district. So the hold harmless provision is line 90, um, and that's the $58 million. Um, in terms of a district by district look, my guess, and I haven't looked at it for that item, but the first place I would go would be to go to the multi-year budget comparison tool. And this would be something, so just so you guys know, um, as board members, this is something that you should be aware of, but really um, this is something that your superintendents and your fiscal, your CFOs are really the best people to be navigating and understanding all of these. And so just your awareness that number one, OSPI updated the multi-year comparison tool. And this tool, I know many of you have looked at it in the past. Um, so I wanted to um, give you a quick look. It is a um, massive interactive um, Excel workbook of sorts. Um, but basically what it does and what it does at this point in time before we have a final budget is it gives you the comparisons of the different budget proposals. And what OSPI has done on this um, in this one that was issued yesterday is they have the governor's proposal, which is the highest watermark. They have the Senate proposal and they have the House proposal. And the House proposal um, is both of those two, the House and Senate are what were adopted on the floor of the given chamber last week. So it should include that hold harmless provision the way I understand this. So we're going to just quickly um, look at a so here's um, district by district. You can look. Um, I don't know why. Oh, it's opening it twice. Awesome. Um, so here you can see um, this is just the state level. Oh, my. I'm sorry. OK, here we go. 
All right, so you can see um, maintenance level, which is sort of just from last year to that needs to be carried forward. You've got the governor's budget from early January, and then you have the House and the Senate budgets. And I'm assuming, um, so these tabs down here are very important to read um, because they will tell you, they should tell us um, which, uh, which drivers or which bills they're using to um, assume the different costs. So yeah, so in gross su substitute House Bill 1109, that is the bill that passed off the floor. So that hold harmless should be factored into what you're seeing here. And um, I don't wanna spend too much time looking at it. You can look at it at your leisure, but um, the columns should include, there we go, there's the hold harmless. So you can see um, that hold, and there is sort of the hold harmless on the maintenance side, but then as you look at the um, hold harmless, actually it is the same. So we would have to dig in a little more on that one, um, but I will keep an eye open for that. And I'll also see if we do have some district by district sheets. It may be something that the house staff have um, because it is different um, in a couple of ways than what WASA's original hold harmless proposal was. So I will see what I can do and um, potentially link to that this weekend. So again, thanks for the question. Um, I'm gonna spend a little more time on the levy and LEA piece in a minute, but as we all know, that's been an issue um, from before the session. It's gonna be an issue as we close out the regular session. Um, if you missed it, um, so you know what happened last week um, with the um, different, the amendment that was added to Senate Bill 5313, which is their levy bill, um, and that is the um, putting some guardrails on the on supplemental contracts from here on out. Um, and so that gives you a hyperlink to that. Um, our association, WASDA, the executive directors of WASDA and WASA, issued a joint statement and also uh, sent a letter to the entire legislature yesterday. Um, just basically, um, the message is that there is legislative support that we are hoping for to help, number one, um, be clear about what is that sandbox around basic education duties and responsibilities of educators, as well as um, the need for some help uh, to contain, put guardrails on, put a sandbox around, put bumpers on, however you wanna talk about them, around local levies um, and protecting them from being used for things they were not intended to be used for. Um, so these hyperlinks take should take you to the letter, um, that Tim and Joel issued, um, as well as the the press statement that was sent to the, the press. Um, the timeliness um, of this, actually a week following what took place last week, um, certainly some of you that re read the Seattle Times might have seen um, an opinion piece from Senator Mullet. Um, so here's the letter. Um, um, it's sort of timely in terms of his message regarding the need for legislative support. So um, anyway, those links will take you there. Um, I'm not gonna spend too much more time on that, but we do, we've gotten some questions about, um, you might recall in past updates, I've talked about the school day language that would put some greater clarity around um, the duties and responsibilities of full-time um, certificated, instructional staff um, that that language isn't in a it isn't a bill that technically is dead right now but again that is one of the, um, the that language is something that we're saying would actually be helpful um, to have in the budget or have somewhere as we move forward and as you look at the bill watch um, you'll see there are several bills, especially in the funding category, I think that's the only place, that are title only bills, that they are just sort of vessels waiting to be filled in the case, in the chance that they need them for something um, as the final days um, draw to a close. Special education, I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, there hasn't been anything new on school employee health care benefits. Um, we know the two proposals. The probably the main thing that's being talked about at this point in time um, is that the bill I mentioned earlier, House Bill 1813, about the health benefits and transportation contracts. Um, so that's one to be aware of. 
so these slides are sort of carryovers from last week um, because the bills, um, the bills themselves haven't changed. This bill actually is now not a proposed um, substitute bill. It has been adopted um, and it does include this same um, language. Actually, I will update this. They did change the threshold for the eligibility, um, the, the free and reduced price meal eligibility from 75 to 70 percent. That was the main change. Um, all the other pieces on this LEA and enrichment levy formula um, approach from the House um, stayed the same. And the Senate's bill has not changed either. Um, like was mentioned earlier, this is the language that is in, now in the adopted budget. Um, and that is something that will definitely be intermixed with both with the conversations at the end. So um, one of the things that we are being asked about is, okay, how does this logistically happen between the Senate bill that did pass the Senate Ways and Means Committee, but now sort of has this um, very controversial, very, very controversial amendment that um, actually I didn't put on here, um, the controversial amendment related to the restrictions on the um, supplemental contracts and whether or not that bill will or won't move out of the Senate, that's certainly anybody's guess at this point in time. Um, on the House side, there's also debate about moving that bill over to the Senate because it will experience similar challenges as what the Senate bill experienced with that which occurred in the Ways and Means Committee. So it may be that the end of the day policy for levy and LEA ends up in a new bill number. It may be that it ends up in the Senate bill number, 5313. But our message right now is that our preference in everything we've seen so far is the language in the House um, the House proposal and their budget related to levy and local effort assistance policy. Um, I do see a question pertinent to this topic. There's a question from Alan from White Salmon um, about whether or not WASA has a position on the enrichment. Yeah, so Senate Bill 5313 also includes a piece on uh, providing for enrichment levy funding to charter schools. Um, we don't actually have a position on that. Um, so it's not that component of the, of the policy um, is not one that we have weighed in on. But that's a great question. If it is something that you think we should have a position on um, in relation to our broader, the association's broader levy and LEA position, um, this is the time to be drafting some words. Uh, you might wanna look for other positions that we have on charter schools. Um, that this is the window where we're soliciting proposals. And I'll speak to that toward the end, but that's um, a great question. Right now, as we're seeing, um, as we're seeing what is and isn't going to move or what issues we wish we could have weighed in more strongly on, um, this would be the time for school boards to be thinking about WASDA's existing suite of legislative and permanent positions and what proposals you might want to either suggest amending positions with or suggesting new positions. All right. Okay, so moving on to special education. Um, this, again, it, it gets a little complicated um, with the different bill numbers. So I'll just um, please, and again, ask me if you have questions. So the different proposals between the House and the Senate started out with House Bill 2140, proposed substitute House Bill 2140. Um, that was the one all of us testified to in the House and in the proposal. You'll remember it had the levy stuff, special ed and parapro, professional development days. Um, they changed the bill when they went to the executive session to just be about levies. Um, but anyway, the, the policy the, that the House proposed that got them to that $69 million was the increase in the multiplier from a 0.96 to a 0.9925. They did not address anything related to that switch with the federal um, safety net and the state funding for safety net. They did not address anything related to the safety net threshold. 
um, of 13.5%. Um, when the House, so I'll just stay in the House right now, the, the House committee was also deliberating on um, Senate Bill 5091. Oops, sorry. My, oh my gosh, hold on. Okay. Uh, they were also uh, deliberating on Senate Bill 5091. Um, and so in what they basically did was they brought 5091 that we believe is looking to be the vehicle as we look at vehicles um and they are proposing they amended the uh, appropriations committee amended 5091 um into a new idea about funding the special education excess cost multiplier this is an idea that no one has really been able to testify on or provide input on or ask questions about um, it is different uh, than the original many multi-tiered model that was proposed earlier in the session in that it gives sort of a two-tiered black and white approach to um, that funding model um, and basically it's based on the percent of time students spend in the general ed classroom or the I think that it's also called the least restrictive environment and so for students spending more time in the general ed classroom the multi the multiplier would be a 1.0 for students spending less than 80 percent of their time in the general ed classroom the multiplier would be a 0.9823 Generally, that approach with the anticipated increase in the number of students that would be spending 80% or more of their time in general ed because of that forcing mechanism for greater inclusion, um, the dollar amount is still anticipated to not be any greater than 69 million. Um, on the Senate side, so this is the, this is what they will be talking about in that conference committee that I described earlier. We believe that the folks involved in that dis those discussions will be from the House. Um, certainly, um, Representative Dolan from the House, potentially uh, Representative Santos, Representative Caldier. Representative Steele uh, from this, the Republican side, um, potentially Representative Paulette. Um, and Representative Sullivan is sort of involved in all of these things as the majority leader. Um, on the Senate side in the conference, we would be looking at um, Re Senator Wellman would be a key piece. Senator Rolfus will likely be involved. Senator Braun is very deeply engaged in this. Um, this policy issue. So um, those are kind of the key players when it comes to this special ed funding conversation. Um, we did ask your legislative, WASA's legislative committee, um, sort of feedback on what what their districts and, and certainly districts in the region, how, what their sort of comments and questions are about the shift to this two-tiered multiplier approach and um, the, the gist is number one, it doesn't address the need for more dollars. Number two, there are questions about this is a pretty, um, ev it's even different than the multi-tiered approach because it's really um, just two and it, and it um, hasn't had, um, there's some feeling that it hasn't been deliberated um, very thoroughly with with districts that would be shifting their systems um, and, and may have many high cost students for whatever reasons that would still receive less money so uh, per student. Um, so the higher cost students would still be a problem that would need to be addressed. So um, if that's something, so I've gathered um, feedback actually from a pretty good cross section of districts from the legislative committee that I'll be sharing um, with with um, legislators who are working on this as well as with OSPI. So if as you sort of walk through these two differences in our mind, the discussion is about this two tiered model versus a single tiered approach. And maybe in the interim, that's something that can be explored is what, what does make sense if we're going to a two tiered structure? What would be the different things in the system that would have to be attended to, to support that in a meaningful way? Um, but at this point, our number one goal is more money into that system.
All right, thank you for typing into the comments. Um, so I am gonna just pause before I move on to the next slide. So there is a question from TJ from San Juan Island um, about whether on the levy proposal, um, there's any insight on the $40,000 um, or not 40,000 students, the FTE number split between um, the levy policy here. And, and um, I don't, I have not talked to anyone about the insights on that, but really the, the main district, this would help, the second one uh, would help with um, 40,000 or more would be obviously the Seattle districts, the, the, large, the largest school districts in the state. It would allow them to levy more dollars um, that they are um, that they are short. So that's that's more of the rationale as far as we know it. All right. Um, okay. So talked about special ed. Um, so basically, as we look ahead to next week, there's only one thing on the calendar. This is a hyperlink to that. Um, it is a hearing on House Initiative 1000. I'm not gonna click on it because that takes a little while, um, but it's a House House Initiative 1000 on Thursday. It's a joint hearing between uh, two uh, House and Senate committees. Um, and uh, that initiative has to do with affirmative action and sort of, um, some, of, of some policies related to that topic area. Um, Otherwise, they're going to be on the floor. So in the in the weekly update, there are links to the TVW channels as well as how you can look at what bills are being deliberated on the floor. Um, in terms of communications, I've mentioned these or most of these earlier, but I'll just sort of um, mention them again. So on the Senate side. In the next few days, it's really important that House Bill 1599 keeps moving. Um, in the um, as we look at what needs to be communicated about that, um, I think there there's resonance around how many students in the class of 19 are um, likely impacted by or not or at risk of not graduating, but also the students that have um, kind of the cost. The cost implications for students. So students that are at risk of losing scholarships if they are not secure, secured a diploma um, or military service or any of the pathways that students um, have planned for their post high school next steps um, could be at risk. That's an important piece of thing to, of information to share. And then the other thing is sort of just the broader uh, social and emotional implications of just this limbo that students are in right now. Um, on that educator workforce bill, um, that one is one that has a lot of really important policy components. It also creates a um, an educator collaborative, a group that is tasked with sort of watching and, and making recommendations on strategies to address the teacher shortage and other really important things that we are, that are continuing for our state. So it creates a structure that can sort of um, help think about this issue going into the future. It's um, been modified enough um, so that it should hopefully be palatable from a budget side of things. Um, so our message would be, we hope it can keep moving. Um, WASA's president, Aurora Flores, did testify on it. She has been talking to legislators about it as well. Um, so hopefully that can be echoed by school districts. I already mentioned House Bill 1813 and 1660 as ones we have concerns on. Specifically on House Bill 1660, the section that we are um, concerned about is Section 6. Um, the rest of the data gathering and other things could be a little messy. I've heard some districts say um, there might be FERPA um, concerns related to privacy issues on da gather gathering data. Um, if that's a concern, that would be helpful for, for me to understand and know. So if you can um, let me know that. But really, the um, Section 6 is the one that we're looking at there. On the House side of things, I think the the main, at this point in the process, the main things that we're talking about are 
Levy and LEA and special ed. Um, and then as we as we get into more bill specifics, um, we will um, see what else we need to be talking about, I guess. Okay. Um, on the budget side of things, so you'll remember last week we talked about sort of the conference committees. I think these are things that I pulled out and I guess um, at risk of being redundant um, are things that we would be reaching out about. So the K3 class size. So if it's not in the bill, we need it to see the funding um, continued in the budget and the delay for districts. Um, I already talked about the special ed pieces. Um, I have a feeling that 5532, which is sort of the policy implementation support bill from Senator Braun, that will probably be one as they talk about the conference committee that um, many in the House and Senate are seeing as a complementary, a companion-like bill to the funding bill, that, that having both of these on the books are important. Um, and then on, in terms of bills that we've been watching and engaging in the school resource officer bill, um, also keeping that alive. There is funding provided in it. Um, on the capital budget side, even though um, these two bills have not moved in the House, they are in the Senate budget. So as the capital budgets go to conference, um, they certainly are part of that conversation. So securing and codifying the rural school modernization grants. And then if the full package of Senate Bill 5853 can't move um, for whatever reasons, there are portions of the bill that we do hope um, end up at least in the capital budget that would help keep the momentum going around and making improvements to the SCAP formula. Um, I didn't finish that sentence. It should say at least section, I think it's section three of that budget. Um, so this would be budget writers. So um, again, this would be the leadership. So the caucus leadership in both the House and Senate, as well as the chairs, vice chairs, and the ranking members. So the ranking minority members of the Senate Ways and Means and the um, capital the Senate Ways and Means, House Appropriations, and then on the capital budget side, it would be from the capital budget committee in the House. Um, and again, see the sticking points, that is sort of um, a given on that one. Um, so if you're wondering, how do I get in touch with these people? Um, this is a link to a spreadsheet that does have all legislator contacts and their legislative assistants and also committees. I don't know that we have a tab on it, um, but we can take a look as to what um, who's in leadership, but I will provide a link to that in this week's update as to when we say leadership, who are we talking about? Because um, that too can be kind of a mysterious thing. Um, as we're also sort of getting up to the opposite house cutoff on Wednesday, um, knowing who's on the rules committees and who you might have a connection with on the rules committees um, is an important thing to do. Usually um, we'd have to look at those names, but usually there's a good proportion of leadership uh, represented on the, on the rules committee as well. Okay, so in the last few minutes, um, I did want to show you a few things because this is, as we um, move up to and then pass the opposite house cutoff, um, things get a little more amoebic. We don't really always know what's happening or what's being talked about. And um, really the two main bills that we are really caring about at this point in time are the budget bills. And because what is funded um, is what happens, right? So um, this is a slide from last week, um, just gives you sort of that process that the House and Senate will enter into um, on right now House Bill 1109. So what left, what the Senate adopted was the Senate's version of House Bill 1109 and what the House adopted is the House's version. So now they're basically going into conference and discussing all of those differences. Um, and so that side-by-side -side I showed earlier, that's um, for education for us, some of the big, big darn deals that they're looking at. Um, so one of the things, so the summary documents are really helpful um, for a quick look at the different budgets. 
Um, but what is also helpful, and I know some of you just love uh, weekend reading, evening reading. So I wanted to just quickly unpack for you um, what I like to spend my weekends doing sometimes is actually reading the budget because the budget is actually a very interesting document to look at. Um, and on that slide are when we're looking at the budget um, for the operating budget, education is, and actually both, it's always either part five or section five or whatever it is. Um, that's sort of the structure by which the two budgets organize where K-12 is. Um, so what I wanna do is show you, um, I just was there, show you on fiscal.wa.gov how you would um, look at that and sort of the things you would jump to. And um, I'm gonna start with the capital budget actually. And the reason I'm doing that is, and in the flow of how things go, I did not mention this earlier, is usually the capital budget and then the bond bill um, which funds the capital budget, those are the last things to happen. The bond bill is kind of the last hurrah, like happy, everybody's happy because uh, all of the projects that were named in the capital budget now have funding in the bond bill. So oftentimes the capital budget is used um, to sort of um, put in projects for legislators. So you, as you have watched hearings over the session, especially as we got to the policy cutoffs and fiscal cutoffs, you'll hear the chair say, hey, everybody on the committee, get me your projects uh, before the cutoffs so we can put them into the budget. And so um, I wanted to just show you a couple places just so you can sort of get a window, get an eye into some of the things might, that might be used for um, sort of some of these end of session discussions and negotiations. So in the, I'm just gonna use as an example, this Senate version of the capital budget. Um, so you would actually open up the budget bill, which is like 300 pages or something. Um, and you would jump to, as we would, uh, we would use, oh, 286, we'd go to part five. And so here's where the things that we looked at in the capital budget are reappropriations, which means it's sort of a maintenance carry forward or new appropriations. And you can see here, there are lots of little subsections. So in, in the first one is about the Puget, the Pierce County Skill Center. Um, then we have the reappropriation of the school construction assistance program. Um, those are reappropriations. Then you have, um, like here you can see, this is at, um, the 1517 SCAP funding. You usually look for new sections here. Here's the emergency grants. Um, but one of the sections that, so it's actually, you know, it's a quick read, it's kind of interesting to look at. Um, but if we were to skip within this broader section to, sorry if you're getting dizzy, um, I'm gonna just quickly go to 5096. So this is an interesting, so this is still within um, historical society, it's for historical society, but you can look at sort of these, this very long list of projects. And so these are some of the things that certain legislators, I mean, they're obviously important needs for their communities, but these are things that they want to be to go back to their communities and say, hey, look at that physical thing I'm helping fix up. So here in Olympia, it would be, look, we're trying to um, enhance the old brew house tower and, and re rehabilitate it. We want money to help us with um, the city of Tumwater to do that. Um, so this list is just one, as you now go back and read the capital budget, you're gonna see a lot of this within the capital budget. Not a bad thing, um, but it's just something that as you're thinking about why are certain individuals voting for certain things, that's one of the pieces that is important to be aware of just kind of in these end, end, of, session, um, end of session negotiations. Um, so when it comes to the operating budget, I'm gonna use the house budget as an example. And I listed on the slide um, the various sections and there are more. The ones I didn't mention on this slide are the sections that are specific to the State Board of Ed or to the PESB or to the Educational Service Districts. 
Um, but the two sections that have the most flexibility for adding new things or naming specific bills um, are section 501, which is money to OSPI to do a bunch of stuff, um, and section 515, which is education reform. And so I'll just give you a quick look at those. Um, how do I get back there? All right, so we're gonna just quickly look at those on the operating budget, and then I'll send you on your way. So again, the way you get to these is you go to bills and documents, and then we're gonna look on this one, on the house example, and then the most current, again, is always at the top, so this is the one that passed the house floor, and what you do here is you, we say, okay, let's go to part and in this case, they use Roman numerals. So we're going to go to part five, which is education. So in this section, so basically um, they give, so they have um, sort of the way the house organizes their budget, their section 501, as you'll see, this first section is base operations and expenses of the office, the office of the superintendent. So, but these are things, so you might wonder where did the, Daniel J. Evans Civic Education Award. You get a memo every spring or fall, um, your districts do, and, and students are nominated. That's a little budget proviso here. Um, and within that $10 million that OSPI gets each year, um, someone in OSPI, there's some cost to OSPI to administer that. That is um, why they do it. It's actually in state law in the budget. It's not a bill by itself, but it's there in the budget. Um, so you can scroll through a lot of these, but then as we get through, I'm going to keep going. Sorry if you are motion sick. Um, but as we get to Um, so here we've got three work groups. So these are work groups in general um, that already exist um, or that they want to have new. If it's named in a, um, in a bill or something like here, um, dyslexia, that is something that is named in a bill from past years. Um, the Healthy Youth Act has a work group, but really where the new bills that are going through the process now are under statewide programs. And so we're gonna see like educational opportunity gap. Um, that was from 2016, House Bill 1541. Um, but we're also going to see um, like here, we have some old school safety money, but then we should start seeing some new bills. Oh, here we go, perfect. So here is House Bill 1216. So you can see that right here on your screen. We're gonna start seeing bills named in the budget and dollar amounts to go with those bills. Um, so now what, what legislators are looking at is what bills were named in the budget, are they moving? Um, if they're not moving, we need to make sure that money stays in the budget. Are there things that we wanted money for that aren't here in the budget? So generally where provisos will be added will be within uh, for for the things that we're really thinking about are within this section 501 um, but there when we think about the school day language or the other um, language around sort of those guardrails that our associations are advocating for um, those might end up in the basic ed employee compensation section or the general apportionment section. General apportionment, that is where you're going to see the prototypical model. The funding for the prototypical model changes to that, professional development days, MSOC, all of those things are in general apportionment because that's what flows in from, from the legislature to OSPI to districts. Special, the big, big darn deals like highly capable, special ed, those sorts of things um, have their own sections because of the um, more complicated nature of their policies. So that's just sort of a high flyby of um, how the two budgets are organized. Um, I think I spoke to these um, things to consider, but again, that's just a little bit of insight as you um, think about these next couple of weeks and the budgets. 
Okay, so in terms of looking ahead, I did already mention that the window is open for new uh, proposals for legislative and permanent positions. If you have, um, we're really, I know some of you on the call today actually um, have engaged in that process. We're really interested in knowing how it's going for you. If the Word version is working for this part of your discussion with your boards, um, how, if the informational materials that we provided are helpful, if they're not, is there anything that you need to help this last um, three week, three or four weeks um, until May 10th uh, for submitting new and returning position proposals. Um, also a shout out to the spring regional meetings. They start next week in DA3. So I think we'll be, um, I don't know where we're going to be in DA3, but that's sort of the Pierce County area. Um, that's the 18th. And then the next one is DA5 which is um, sort of the Thurston Lewis Mason counties will be in Aberdeen on the 30th. And then we go into May and we have a bunch more. The rest of them are in May. So we really do hope to see you there. We'll be doing sort of building on what happened in the fall, thinking about supports around budgeting and bargaining um, as um, those issues obviously continue as they always do. So next week, same thing, same time, same place. Um, and then just the rest of the slide deck are the resources for you. So with that, I know we went a little bit over. Thank you for sticking around. Um, it's great to see so many of you on the live webinar. Again, if you have specific things or questions you have um, that you'd like me to address in the written update or next week, um, or just are curious about, feel free to email or call me. Um, and with that, I'll sign off. Thanks again for all you're doing and have a great weekend.